Dean, a matchbox is five centimetres long. You happy with that? Yes, I can see that. Right, it gives us a problem though. And that's how to drop a matchbox from its own height of five centimetres mm -hmm. and have it land and stay on its end. I bet you can't. Uh, I might be able to, but I think I'll have to do it very carefully. Very carefully. Okay. Okay. Just five centimetres. Don't mm. make it hard. It bounces. Yeah. Yeah. You uh, might fluke one, but... Uh... Can I hold it any way I like? Yeah, sure. All right, I'll try putting my fingers underneath it and then quickly... No, that didn't help at all. Uh, what if I build in a sort of shock absorber? That by, sounds a good uh, idea. Um, opening the tray a little bit. Uh, I think that's better. Yeah, it doesn't bounce as much, does it? No. I think I'm getting closer, but the matches are sort of getting in the way and coming out. What if I put the shock absorber in? No, you're really warm. Okay. Let's Five centimetres? Mm-hmm. Got it. Ah, works! <laughs> Amazing! Yeah, the drawer slams. That takes a lot of the energy that otherwise is bounce. Great well, trick. really, that's, I mean, that's easy, isn't it? Well, Here's a smart. harder one. Here's a harder one. Take a one cent coin, same height, five centimetres. Yes. How can you drop that so it lands and stays on its edge? Oh, that's impossible. Oh, not no, a coin. Not. Hmm? Oh, if you had plasticine and no, dropped it into Whatever you've got that. on the table, nothing else. Oh, let me try. No. Ridiculous. Got It'll him. never work. Got him this time. And in case it's got you too, we'll come back at the end of the program and show you how it's done. Watching gunshots, but you're not hearing them. How is that sound effect made? With nothing more than a couple of scrap pieces of timber. Clap them together and you get this sound. And for convenience, I've nailed handles on the back of each so you don't squash your, your fingers in between. But of course, that's a pretty dead sound, and it's made even deader by the fact that the microphones you get on your little tape recorder are made so that if you hit them with a very loud sound, they stop recording, so you get this terribly flat sort of noise. You need a bit of reverberation, best gained at home, in a bathroom. And here are the effects you'll get. First of all, right by the machine in an ordinary room. Which sounds extremely dead. Go into a small bathroom and you get a bit of reverberation and it sounds a lot better. And if you want to get gunshots in the Grand Canyon, go into an enormous bathroom. You get a lot of reverberation. So, depending on the script of your play, you can make the appropriate sound effect of gunshots.
little worried about my fingers. I find that every time I snap them, strange things happen. Storms start, doors slam close, cars change direction. It's really quite worrying. Have a look at this. I'll take an ordinary tin can and I'll roll it along the floor. And then just before it stops, I'll flick my fingers and look what happens. It comes back. Amazing, a tin can changes direction simply because I flick my fingers. That's impossible. Here we go again. Amazing. Wonder if it works if I clap my hands. An impossible can. It's not actually impossible, it's a sneaky trick. Do you notice that I had the Curiosity Show question mark on the can and the same thing on the other end? They weren't there just because it's the Curiosity Show, they were to hide something from you so you couldn't see it. Look at that, and that's part of the trick. You see what it is? It's half a, an ice cream stick. And if we look at the other end of the can, peel off the label there, same thing exactly, half an ice cream stick. Can you see what else is there in the center? Can you tell what it is? Right, it's a very thick rubber band. In fact, to make this can, all you need is an ice cream stick broken in halves and a large rubber band and one more thing, big heavy lump of plasticine and of course a can, then you can put them together to make an impossible can. Can you think of how they're arranged inside the can? So you think you've solved the case of the impossible can. Let's see if you are correct. I'll pull the lid off just a little way and see if you figured it out like this. There it is. Large lump of plasticine firmly attached to the large rubber band which stretches from end to end and the plasticine is arranged in such a way that it hangs downwards. And it does this for a very good reason. If I slip off the uh, piece of ice cream stick from that end of the can and also from this end of the can, I can take out the motor. There it is. That's the motor for the impossible can. You can now guess what happens, can't you? As we roll it along the floor, what happens, of course, is the lump of plasticine stays put because it's big and heavy. And the rubber band winds up, twists like that, until the can stops. Then you have a tightly wound rubber band, twisted many, many times, and that makes the can roll back in the opposite direction. And when it went past me, of course, the rubber band twisted in the other direction. The lump of plasticine stayed where it was, so it went rolling backwards and forwards because the rubber band was twisting one way and then the other. If you want to make one of these, there's one thing you'll have to be very careful with, and that's making the hole in the tin can. You'll need an adult to help you, and you'll need an old pair of scissors. What you need to do is not press too hard, just press gently in the middle with one of the blades of the scissors. Get it as near to the centre as you can. Just go backwards and forwards. Keep your fingers well clear of the point, and keep on doing this until you feel the point of the scissors just start to penetrate the metal. And at that point, you then make the hole larger by twisting it around until it's large enough to poke the rubber band through. And you do the same thing the other end, and then you reassemble the can, and you have an impossible can. So to put it together, what we need first of all is the rubber band coming through from the inside the can to the base, the piece of ice cream stick goes across, and then you have to stretch the rubber band upwards like this, poke it through the, the lid. You need to try and get enough poking through the lid so that you can then put the ice cream stick on top. And then the last thing that you do is to put the lump of plasticine in the center. To do that, you'll need to hold the, hold the tin can open prise the lump of plasticine apart a little bit like that and then wrap that around the rubber band in the centre of the can. There we are, put it in the centre, as close to the middle as you can and arrange it so that most of the bulk of the plasticine hangs downwards but doesn't quite touch the base of the can. And when you've done that, 
you have a can, that's uh, impossible? No, just a sneaky trick. Oh good, you're just in time to join me in a competition. So I've got a couple of photographs of people you might know here and I'm putting them up to see if you can tell who they are and which is which. Yes, you've guessed it, it's Dean and myself. You can tell that even upside down, because the eyes give it away, don't they? Strange thing about eyes, you look at eyes to see what people are thinking. The eyes are the windows of the soul, it's been said. They tell, you if, they tell people if you're being direct or if you're being shifty or threatening or morose. It's all there in the eyes. And if you start doing odd things to them, you get some of those rather disconcerting effects. So let's get rid of these. These are stuck out of, cut out of a magazine and stuck onto dark glasses. And they're hiding the, the real eyes. But if you muck around with eyes in photographs or pictures or cartoons or drawings, you can get some weird effects because the eyes are such a, a focal point of a face. Have a look at this one. I'm going to bring it up in front of me. And it's a picture of Dean. Or is it me? Or what is it? In fact, it is disconcerting. It's got Dean's face with my eyes glued in on top of his. The trouble is with a picture like that is you're never quite sure where to look. You try to look for the eyes, but there are two sets of them, so your gaze shifts between the two of them. You're never sure where to look. And that's a slightly weird effect. Well, that's what's happening in a different way with these photographs up here of Dean and myself. You see, if they look all right to you there, you're like most people. Most people see them as OK. But you watch what happens when I turn my photograph upside down. You'll notice something strange happening as it goes horizontal. There we go. Dear me, what's happening to the man's eyes? In fact, what I've done is to cut my eyes out and turn them upside down. And when you see the face upside down, or, and the eyes right, it looks OK. The face round the right way and the eyes upside down looks absolutely horrendous. So let's turn it back the way it looks best. And it's a very weird thing. As long as the eyes are up the right way, your perception of the face, although the face is upside down, it's quite good. It's easily recognisable. In fact, more recognisable than the entire face and eyes upside down. Well, there you have it. It's in the eyes. And the same thing's true with that picture of Dean's there. I've cut his eyes out and turned them upside down, and you get that strange shift as he goes horizontal. He looks very mean, and then really quite peculiar, because his eyes are upside down too. Turn him up the other way, he starts to look normal, you can compare it with a photograph of him, which has been unattacked. Not much difference, apparently, upside down, but that one looks more recognisable. So it's in the eyes again. And in fact, so much so that even if you take a larger piece of the face that isn't the eyes and turn it upside down, you don't get that effect at all. Here we are. There's me with my nose upside down. It just looks silly. It looks like me with my nose upside down. Turn it up there, and again, it looks silly. You don't get anything of that effect that you do when you turn the eyes upside down. So, there you are, a graphic demonstration, but really, it's in the eyes. Sounds absurd, but in fact, there is a way. By the way, do you know why your trousers, slacks or jeans so frequently fall off the coat hanger? 
onto the floor. You've probably noticed this sort of thing happening frequently in your wardrobe at home. And the reason and the reason it happens is because you don't pay enough attention to the center of gravity of your trousers. Let's think of a seesaw. Uh, a couple of little guys sitting on a seesaw. If you try and make them balance, uh, you'll find that it just doesn't seem to work. The person on this end is much heavier than the person on the other end. So even though we have that turning point in the middle of the seesaw, it doesn't work. Of course, most of the weight is down this end. What we can do to make them balance, though, is to shift the turning point until it comes along somewhere around about here. We find now that it's almost balancing. Look at that. And in fact, if that's the turning point, now they can set to it and they can seesaw backwards and forwards as long as they like. Okay, that's a seesaw. What's that got to do with trousers? Well, I'm glad you asked. You see, a, a pair of trousers is very much like a seesaw. There we are. If you had a starched pair of trousers like that, you might try and balance them at the very middle point. That's probably where you hang them up, bend them over the coat hanger at that point. But let's see what happens to the trousers if we try and balance them as a seesaw. Just doesn't work, does it? They fall over that way. And they do that, of course, is because you have more weight here. Not only is there more material, but there are things like zips and buttons and studs and belt loops and lining and pockets and all sorts of things. And so the balance point is not halfway down the leg at all. But in fact, if I slide this along, we find that it's around about one third of the way down the leg, two thirds on the other side. So if we want to make the, the, the trousers stay on the coat hanger, we need to keep that in mind. How do we do that? Well, when you're about to hang up your trousers, uh, what you should do is to lay them out flat on a table, bed, anything you like. Don't make the mistake of just folding them in halves like that, because if you do, it's very much like an, a seesaw that's out of balance, and the heavy end will pull down. What you need to do is to fold them into a sort of a zigzag shape, like this. Across, and then back again, so that they're folded into thirds. And now, slide the coat hanger through to this position here, and you have the heavy end down one side, one third of the trousers that side, two thirds the light end on this side. And with the trousers in that position, in your wardrobe, they'll stay there as long as you like. Got a little surprise for you. Oh, thank you very much, Not Rob. Not at all. Um, Dean, don't open until Christmas. Until Christmas? Well, if it's for me, why shouldn't I have a little peep? I guess I deserved that. A typical Rob present. What is it and how did he make it? It's a tiny burglar alarm for your private letters. And here's how it's made, very simply. First of all, get a bit of wire. I find giant paper clips are very good and they're about the right length, 15 centimetres. But if you can't get one of those and straighten it out, go for a bit of ordinary wire and get 15 centimetres of that. It'll look like this when you have. And most of the work can be done in your fingers. Make sure it's just possible to bend it in your fingers. But then you'll need a pair of pliers to make a little hook on each end. And make that hook go in the same direction. In this case, I'm making it go up at that end. So I'll have to make it go up at the other end. It's going to look like a pair of very wide buffalo horns. Then I bend that into a bow with the hooks pointing to the outside. Like that. There we go, a nice, smooth, even bow. You can fix that up and make it a bit neater, but that's about what you want. A neater version will look like that. Now I need to string it, and for that you'll need a rubber band, which is fairly thin and just the right length to go tightly between those two hooks. If it's too loose, you can spread that bow. If it's too tight, you can loosen the bow. But about like that is, is right. It's like a bow and arrow, or, or the bow from a bow and arrow set with two bow strings on it. Now put that to one side and make the paddle wheel. 
which I think is best made out of cardboard, but you can use the plastic out of uh, ice cream container lids, and they, they work very well. Cut off a little paddle like that, about one and a half centimetres by two. You need to make four notches, so it looks in the end like that. Two from each side, not getting too close to the middle. Here we go. Pair of scissors, one snip, two snips, three snips, four snips. Take out those bits of waste in the middle without twisting the cardboard too much and turn it round and do it on the other side. There we go. And the rubber band's going to thread through those to make the paddle wheel. And it has to be done in a particular way. So once you've got them clipped out, go back to the bow and its bow strings and put on the paddle wheel in this way. First of all, take one of those sides of the rubber band and pass it over the middle leg of the paddle wheel on one side. If it goes over it on one side, it's got to go under it on the other side, like this. If you do it like that, it won't pull the paddle wheel apart when you twist the whole thing up. There we are. It's loaded. Over the middle leg there, under the middle leg there. To set it, just wind it up. About ten twists will do the job. And when you find that rubber band starting to kink double, as it's doing now, the thing's ready. And to make it go off, get a bit of paper that's folded over that acts as a sort of drum skin. Slide the thing into it and hold the paddle wheel so it doesn't unroll. Put the whole thing inside an envelope. Write whatever message you want on the envelope and seal it up. Once that flap's stuck down, of course, the thing is set and ready to catch whoever tampers with it. Because when they come along and they open up this flap and start to peer inside, they let the sides of the envelope and the paper come away from the paddle wheel and of course it unwinds with a dickens of a noise and they're caught by your personal envelope alarm. Rob, that's absolutely impossible. There's no way I can drop a one cent coin from a height of five centimetres or any other height and yes, make it stand on its edge. Yes, there is. Can't be done. Well, you leave it alone and I'll show you how. You can use whatever you got on the table. Okay? Right. One of those things, because I put it there, is a bottle. Oh. And it happens to have some water in it, which I also give well, away. I have to take a bit of care here, but if you pour some of the water out mm -hmm. and wet the side of the bottle, yes. and also wet the coin, mm -hmm. then you've got two wet surfaces and they're going to stick together, okay? Oh, there. I see. Let the coin go, about five centimetres. Let him go yeah. and... Amazing. Side. Mm. 
And you can experiment at home. You'll need a bottle with a straight side. You can see how good you can get and what height you can drop it from and have it still stand on its side. And also try it with larger coins. See if you can make it work with a 10-cent coin. See you again next week. Goodbye. Curiosity.